Okay. How is it going? Let's go. Ooh. So today we're going to be talking about the secrets of making high quality art in Blender and everywhere. So, but be before we get started, let me just briefly introduce myself to get it out of the way. So my name is Gleb Alexandrov. I have a wife, <laughs> a kid, a cat, a blog, Blender 2.8 test build, a Blind Guardian t-shirt, a useless Elo account, a useful YouTube account, some fancy renders, some renders that suck, the panic monster to help me fight procrastination, and a caffeine addiction. So, why do some renders suck and others don't? Or how should I put it? Why do some renders get in the editor's pick on art station, receive lots of love, awards, stuff like that, and others, even from the same artist, end up in a gray zone? Not bad, but not great either. I think most people in this room have had this experience of creating something in Blender, uh, say concept art or a 3D model for a game or just a render, and then realizing that something about it looks terribly off. It looks off, but you can't put your finger on what exactly is wrong about it. So you go to Blender Artists or, or maybe you go to Facebook and you ask your Facebook friends, hey, what's wrong with my render? And everybody really adds to your confusion. You get a bunch of mutually exclusive comments like, add some interest, add details, or keep it minimal, remove something out of it. Or maybe it's about colors, or check your references, or my favorite, improve composition. <laughs> Thank you. But what exactly? So today I want to talk about one particular theory in composition that, uh, in my opinion, has a great potential for explaining many, many things and for preventing such situations when your render obviously suck, but you don't know what to do and where to start. So this is kind of a secret of making high quality art that is being used, I believe, by successful artists from Blizzard, DreamWorks, Industrial Light and Magic, Pixar, by artists like Torfrek, Vitaly Bulgarov, Neil Blevins, many, many others. By Blender artists, of course, like Daniel Bystead, Master Zion, me. <laughs> so, in fact, all these renders that you see behind me have this thing in common. But before we uh, begin talking about what the heck is this thing, let me just say, A, it's not a prescribed mathematical method, B, it works, C, uh, how many of you guys have heard about Neil Blevins by show of hands? One, two, just two people, all right. How many of you guys haven't heard about Neil Blevins? <laughs> the rest of you. Especially for those of you who haven't heard about Neil. Neil is a professional 3D artist who specializes in robots, alien creatures, sci-fi landscapes, stuff like that. Now working as a digital artist for Pixar Animation Studios, Neil has a blog, neilblevins.com, where he's posting extremely useful tutorials on composition, on 3ds Max, on many things. So a couple of years ago, I stumbled across one of his tutorials uh, that was called Primary, Secondary, Tertiary Shapes. And the main thought of this tutorial was that if your image has a nice distribution of big, medium, and small shapes, the resulting image will tend to be more pleasing to the eye. And once I read this tutorial, and once I saw these diagrams, of the right and the wrong distribution of big, medium, small shapes inside the composition, I thought, well, that's great. I also love simplifying stuff like that. Like, arrange your big, medium shapes inside the composition like this, you win, arrange it like this, you lose. And I wanted to kind of crash test this theory that Neil has planted into my head, so I took a bunch of top-rated works from CG Hub, Actually, these are from ArtStation. Back then, it was CG Hub, 
one of the most popular online galleries, like Pornhub for CG artists, if you know what I mean. <laughs> so I took a bunch of top-rated works, and I started painting big, medium, small shapes with red, blue, yellow, like this. And after some painting, I started to realize that the distribution of shapes in all these images really looks similar. It really looks like what Neil has described in his tutorial. And I think that's a very important thing that helped me just in my work and had an incredibly positive influence on how I tend to do things. But before we ask what the heck, let's try to make sense of it. So definitions first. Primary shapes are your big shapes. It's a kind of a shape that you see if you squint at an image. As soon as you blur your eye, it already reads. Secondary shapes are your smaller shapes that break up or sit on top of the primary shapes. Tertiary shapes are, again, even smaller details. Successful images tend to have all these three levels in place, and they are balanced against each other. Big shapes are needed because they help to organize all other shapes. Small shapes are needed because of many reasons, one of which is pure curiosity and desire to explore the image. And obviously, secondary shapes are needed to give a transition between big and small. Miss one level, things go haywire. All bad renders in the world have this sin of uh, breaking a balance say, whether it's a wall, a huge wall that is covered with tiny, tiny bricks without any middle ground, or whether it's a robot which lacks just intricate details. Uh, the successful renders, on the other hand, tend to have all these three levels in place, and they fall into a certain kind of balance. And we find images pleasing that fall into a certain kind of balance, just like we find music pleasing that has all frequencies represented. Imagine your favorite song. Now imagine the waveform of it. Like try to cut off the high frequencies and it will sound muffled. And if you cut off the bass, it will sound teeny. You can't crank up or cut off a certain band of frequency without ruining the sound. An appealing design is no different. Have big, medium, small shapes have them in a certain balance. Uh, but then the natural question arises. Is there any way to determine the right size for the shapes? Say, a certain proportion, a golden ratio? The answer would be yes and, and no. I tried to calculate uh, using uh, these renders, for example. Uh, but I didn't manage to find out for sure is, if there is any kind of common proportion manifesting itself through all these images or not. Because obviously, artists tend to choose different proportions based on many things, on style, on, on the scale, on personal preference, on the time of the day. Uh, but that being said, I still see some kind of ratio in play. To me, uh, the ratio between big, medium, small shapes in this bunch of renders that I have cherry-picked from ArtStation looks Something like 1 to 5 hyphen 1 to 10. So when I say medium, I actually mean 5 to 10 times smaller than the big. And when I say small, I actually mean 5 to 10 times smaller than the medium. But don't take it too seriously. It's not some divine proportion of awesome CG art or something like that. <laughs> Hey, at least we know that it's a range of sizes rather than some fixed size. So it's very important to have variety to the sizes of shapes in each three categories. And what's really crucial is how you distribute these shapes inside your composition. Straight ahead rhythm gets boring very quickly. Uh, if you take a look at these two diagrams, you will notice that the right distribution is much more natural and kind of unpredictable. As a result, the eye stays in the image for a longer time. The eye has some things to explore. The eye doesn't get bored by this repeating pattern of small shapes. 
Because once the eye recognizes the pattern and solves the mystery, its case closed. I mean, who still keeps looking for their shoes once they've found them. That would be stupid. So I think the best way to talk about it is to take a look at some more examples. Here you can see the primary shape broken down into three rather boring slabs. And also you can see the abundance of small shapes spread out kind of uniformly across this image. And the uniform distribution like this is really uncomfortable to look at. It doesn't give the eye any spot to rest. And it doesn't have enough variety to keep us looking. I wonder if you agree with me, but this distribution of shapes looks much, much more enjoyable. Because now we don't see this horrible block of small shapes spread out in the uniform pattern. Lots of things is going on here. We see some areas of high frequency details, some areas with practically no details, medium shapes, different looking medium shapes, pattern breakers. And it really adds dynamics, it adds visual interest. Successful images tend to have a somewhat unpredictable distribution of shapes with just enough surprise to keep us watching. Whether it's a substance material or a concept art, if you allow me um, yet another musical metaphor, imagine you have to choose between two drum tracks. The first one being and the second one I bet you would choose the one with more groove because who doesn't love a good funky beat? So, so far we have big, medium, small shapes distributed in a somewhat unpredictable way. The next thing we have to master is an empty space. It's very important, I think, to have an empty space in your distribution of shapes because it gives the actual features more space to breathe. It allows them to speak more loudly. If all areas of your... Uh, by the way, this is amazing render by Master Zion. I love it. And if all areas of your image have an equal amount of energy, you're doing it wrong. You just have to balance the areas of visual detail with the areas of visual rest. Otherwise, you will create something like this Dynaboard from the last night and the age of extinction. Total rubbish. <laughs> Here's musical metaphor number three for you guys. Imagine an orchestra. Now imagine all musicians of this orchestra started playing at once with maximum loudness. This would sound just like this Dynaboard, if you know what I mean. You just have to balance areas of detail with the areas of rest. If I had to create a transformer, I would have definitely included some empty space inside the composition, just to make sure that I avoid this Dynaboard effect. Great renders always have some negative space to balance uh, the areas of density. Some renders have lots of negative space, just like this by one by Torfrag. So let's imagine we have followed through all the steps of this theory and we got big, medium, small shapes with a variety to the sizes of shapes in each three categories. We have a somewhat unpredictable distribution. We balance the areas of details with the areas of rest. The benefit of doing all of this is having clumps or groups of shapes emerging here and there. And that's the fourth and final hallmark of high quality art for today. Uh, there is a universal agreement on both ends of the spectrum, from pixel art nerds to photographers, that a having points of interest is good for your composition, and B, it's better to have three, five, seven, nine objects rather than lots of objects. It's just a better way of organizing the space and guiding the viewer's eye through the composition. 
And if you pretty much follow through all the steps of this tutorial, you will get this as a bonus. As Cynix, the YouTube design genius, points out, our visual system enjoys grouping objects together into larger, more manageable objects. So clumping can make an image more brain friendly, hence makes it more aesthetically pleasing. Needless to say, if you now take a look at all this, uh, editors, pics, you will see these clumps or groups of shapes everywhere. And I can go through this endlessly, just, just check it out, guys. So, these are very important things to consider when you're basically making an image. Let's once again recap them. First, have big, medium, small shapes. Have a variety to the sizes of shapes in each three categories. Uh, make sure that the distribution of shapes inside the composition is somewhat unpredictable and chaotic. Uh, balance the areas of details with the areas of rest and allow these clumps or groups of shapes to flourish. And of course, uh, the rules like this are just guidelines, much like every other rule in design and composition. And it's up to you as a 3D artist to determine what's right or wrong for the composition. But the next time you will have this question, don't immediately go to Facebook. Just think about big, medium, small shapes and their distribution. Thank you. <laughs>